So we have uh, seven talks in 60 minutes. Everybody gets about eight minutes. I will ping you at about six minutes and please wind up so that we have a little bit of time for discussions and questions. Um, please introduce yourself briefly at the beginning of the talk for each one so that I don't do that, okay? So we'll begin with the talk for Haystack from uh, Jans Kaufman. Take it away, Jans. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, they just started with a saw outside my window, so I hope you can understand me. Let me know in case there is audio trouble. You sound so, good. Uh, I'm Jens Kaufmann. I'm at Haystack Observatory. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll talk about the potential role of Haystack in the EHT or in GEHT. Um, so, oops. Um, I should make clear here that uh, uh, I'm, of course, supported and have a lot of material here from a lot of people at Haystack. It was impossible to sort out who contributes to what, what here. So uh, just a reminder that there are plenty of people who are contributing to the work uh, described here. Um, so Haystack Observatory um, is roughly an hour from downtown Boston. It's the site of the US-based EHT color, uh, correlator. It's also the site of the 37 meter telescope that you see here. And as you see here, we also have quite a large uh, site around us uh, that can host uh, future potential instruments. Um, and I'm going to talk primarily about the Haystack telescope, but um, it would be inappropriate not to mention that this is all relating to many other activities at Haystack. Uh, for example, we have the lead organization by the NSF MSIP supported EHT efforts. We have the US-based uh, EHT correlator uh, at our site. Uh, and of course, much of the recording equipment you are all using at your sites uh, has been designed at uh, Haystack. And we are also the, uh, hosting the IMA phasing project that enables IMA uh, as a VLBI station. Um, concerning the 37 meter telescope, um, many of you might have used or seen this telescope ages ago. Um, but this has been uh, massively rebuilt and uh, with a rebuild completed in 2013 and has now roughly a 37 micron measured surface accuracy and is actually designed for radar up to 150 gigahertz. And kind of unique for a telescope of this side, uh, size, uh, it's really fast and slow speed and it can in principle access any spot on the sky within say roughly a minute which could in principle be very interesting for uh, transient uh, observations. Um, the operational model of the uh, telescope is as follows that um, uh, the primary mission of the uh, telescope is to serve as a space radar at 10 and 90 gigahertz for a defense mission. Uh, but there are regular night and weekend uh, uh, observations for research and other slots can be uh, negotiated. One really nice feature for this telescope is that the maintenance cost uh, is paid by the defense mission. So if you want to do research, you actually pay the instrumentation and the operator, but not uh, the uh, upkeep of the telescope itself. Um, I should uh, mention that the astronomy systems were not part of that overall. Um, and so we are still uh, working on uh, uh, improving the astronomy hardware on the telescope. And there are several steps to that. Uh, one is to uh, increase the manpower and expertise. Uh, that's, for example, one of the reasons why I was hired uh, 2017 uh, into a haystack um, to help with uh, focusing work on this effort. Uh, we are in the process of acquiring funding. Uh, for example, we are uh, receiving funding from the NGHT uh, and also have been able to dispense uh, substantial internal funding over recent years. And that allows us currently to replace old and uh, hard to maintain telescope systems for, for example, the single dish backend and the control system, which were very difficult to maintain and uh, to operate are currently being replaced with modern system uh, uh, systems. And of course, we're also improving the system uh, performance. For example, we have 
uh, new amplifiers in our W band receiver system for three millimeter wavelength. Uh, activities which were delayed because of the pandemic is to develop a broad science case for the telescope uh, and to develop a broad user community for the telescope. Um, and so this is not the subject of this talk, but in case you're interested in general in this telescope, please reach out to me because we are very interested to learn what else we should do with this telescope and who might want to use it. Um, over the last rough year, we have made substantial uh, improvements to the telescopes. And so we had a major uh, upgrade of systems for uh, observations at 90 gigahertz, uh, just completed a few weeks ago. We have a new single dish backend to be commissioned this winter, new uh, telescope control system to be commissioned this winter. And we have the goal of testing the LBI at 86 gigahertz this window, uh, this winter. Um, all of this, uh, or the NGEHT funded work, prepares a proposal for VLBI observations at 230 gigahertz. Yeah, telescope is not set, uh, the haystack is not a, such an ideal dish or site, um, but it would be a great telescope to complement, for example, the new NGEHT dishes of probably less than 12 meter sites. So this is a 36, so 37 meter telescope, even under non ideal conditions it will deliver a lot of sensitivity. Yeah, it's two more minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, the site characteristics are also appropriate for that, in particular in the winter month, where we get uh, pretty decent weather conditions without going into the details here. Um, Haystack has also an interesting aspect that it can uh, serve as a really interesting station for transcontinental links, as you see here. Um, um, uh, is one of the, it would be able to deliver a very east uh, lying station in the continental US or out to Europe, for example. And uh, without going into the details for that, uh, it can be shown that in some of the configurations that you could, uh, can consider adding haystack uh, to the constellation of telescopes uh, substantially decreases side lobes and other image improves other image aspects. Of course, we also have um, uh, another 18 meter telescope together with a 37 meter telescope at the side. And we can, in principle, operate uh, and observe at frequencies somewhere between 2 and 115 gigahertz. And one of the uh, potential applications of this telescopes would be, for example, to deliver triggers for the NGEHT, in case this is uh, of interest or to deliver general monitoring uh, in between scheduled uh, VLDI. 30 seconds. Um, obviously, the NGHT will need a lot of uh, hardware development. And the NGHT, to my opinion, should also have a broad uh, educational program. I will talk about that on Friday, because if you don't have that, you leave a lot of funding opportunities on the table. And uh, Haystack is an interesting site for development and uh, education because of its location outside of Boston and at low altitude where you have decent oxygen level. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jans. Okay, we have a little bit of time if anybody has a question. I cannot see raised hands if the LOC can see. I don't see any hands. Okay, I'll just ask one quick question, Jans. What's the time scale you think to get to 230? Is 230 gigahertz realistic at all at ASEC? Oh, it's certainly realistic. Um, we are scheduled to uh, deliver a study. Uh, I, I think that we are we committed to delivering a study by the end of 2023. Um, and so that would be consistent uh, with the time scale for the build out of the or build out of the NGEHT. So 2023 plus two or plus three, four years to deliver then the, to install the actual hardware on the telescope, potentially quicker if we have a quicker access to, to a receiver. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jans. Uh, we move on to the next uh, telescope projects, LAMA. Uh, I think Zulima is there to uh, take this on. Can you please start, Zulima? 
Sorry, I was mute. Uh, okay. Uh, sure. Can you see my screen? Uh, it's blank. Oh, yeah, there we are. Good. Okay. Thank you. Let me start uh, here. Yes, I was a bit. Okay, I'm Zulime Abraham from the University of São Paulo in Brazil, and uh, Manuel Fernandes uh, from the Instituto, Instituto Argentino de Radioastronomia is part of the project also, besides many other people. And I'm talking about llama, it's not llama, it's llama, it's this nice uh, uh, animal in here. But uh, Llama really, is, uh, as a project, is a bilateral project between Brazil and Argentina. And Llama stands for Large Latin American Millimeter Array. And the name is because of the original project consisted in the installation of two radio telescopes in the Argentina side of the Atacama Desert to do VLBI with ALMA, APEX, or whatever. Uh, but the actual project consists in only one radio telescope to be installed in Alto Chorizo, that's uh, uh, this place in here. And uh, it's at 186 kilometers from, uh, uh, from Alma at an altitude of uh, 4,800 meters in the province of Salta. Uh, in Argentina, and the idea is to do uh, single dish observations, VLBI, be part of EHT, and so forth. Uh, well, even the, if the project uh, started in 2008, uh, the uh, financing started in 2014, and then there was an agreement uh, signed between the Ministry in Argentina of Science and Technology and uh, uh, FAPESP, an institution of Sao Paulo State, and the University of Sao Paulo, who is the owner of the radio telescope. Uh, the radio telescope is a 12 meter Alma dish built by Vertec. It was really the last uh, dish built by Vertex. Uh, but it has two Nasmith uh, cabins similar to Apex, and it will operate at ALMA bands of band one, two and three, five, six, seven, and nine. Uh, right now we have band nine and five receivers, the front end and the warm parts completed. And the reason to start with band nine is because we got a grant through a joint project uh, between FAPESP and NWO in the Netherlands to develop a receiver, a single sideband receiver. Uh, and band five is an ALMA prototype donated by ALMA. Uh, band six is, go, is building, it being built now by NOVA and will be ne uh, ready next year. And band two and three together will be built by the University of Chile so a partnership between Brazil and China and Chile. And the idea is to have it finished in two years, but they are starting it now. We will have two cryostats, one for each cabin. Uh, each uh, cryostat holds three cold cartridges and uh, it was built by the uh, National Observatory of Japan. Uh, and will hold bands five, six, and nine. Uh, we already have the optical telescope and we are building a holographic transmitter and receiver will be lent by ALMA for the first light. In 2016, we obtained a small grant from FRAPESP and NWO um, to adapt LAMA software to be used in VLBI. Uh, Brazil got financing for a large part of the LBI hardware, but unfortunately we have to spend the money on other things, so we didn't buy anything uh, for BLBI. But Llama was going to join the HT in 2017, 
start operation in 2018 and do the first VLBA observations in 2019. But then we have an accident. The radio telescope was delivered uh, by Vertex in 2017, but the containers had to be uh, moved, translated from the port near Buenos Aires to the site at 2,200 kilometers uh, kilometer distance. There was an accident with the truck and the, that carried the, the yoke and the yoke had to be rebuilt. The insurance paid for everything, but uh, they delayed the projects for at least two years. Another problems were some health problems with the Argentinian uh, directors, two directors, and uh, the Argentinian government took a long time to indicate a new director who was not a radio astronomer. Fortunately, the yoke uh, arrived in Argentina in 2020 and was safely translated, uh, translated to the site. You can see here the, the, the track. And in here is the site uh, with the containers with the radio telescope. Uh, changes in the federal government in Argentina and in the Ministry of Authorities grew, brought new life to the project. And now we have a new management, an experienced company, uh, Colimbab, was contracted in Argentina to take care of the Llama management. Llama, uh, two minutes to go, Zulema. Okay. Uh, Imbab will be responsible in the first uh, phase for the foundation and the mounting of the radio telescope to, together with Vertex. Uh, its uh, solar energy plant is being installed. And in the second phase, we will have the AV and commissioning phase until first light. And they expected to end the first phase, uh, phase uh, by the middle of uh, 2023 and one year later, the second phase. Um, so for the first light, we will have only one cabin. Operations will remote in San Antonio de los Cobres. It's a city at 3,800 uh, 3, meters uh, height, so it's not easy, but there is already a building uh, built for the operations. Uh, and then the operations will pass to the uh, city of Salta at 800 meter altitude, so it might be much better. Um, the delay gave us the opportunity to prepare a receiver for uh, DHT, and there is an engineer group at the Instituto Argentino de Freud Astronomia. It was mentioned in the study. Yes, uh, collaborating with the uh, backend. And uh, they are studying to implement the backend uh, also for single dish observations. And regarding to the new dual frequency receiver, uh, the place to put it will be probably in the Casa Green caving if we want to join the EHT. And thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the status of the Llama project. Thank you very much, Salama. We have some time for a little questions. Anybody? Questions? Zulema, what, how does the budget situation look for uh, <laughs> operations? Uh, well, uh, that, that's the problem. We don't have a budget and, and we don't have a, even a Liam Observatory status. So up to now, what we have is an agreement within, uh, within the uh, two agencies, the ministry in Argentina and FAPESP in Brazil, but we, we are not an observatory yet. So we don't have any administrative status. And that's one of the problems, uh, for example, for joining officially the HT because we cannot uh, sign anything. Uh, so we don't know really uh, what the future will be. Uh, now we are waiting until the antenna is up just to go to our governments as ask for money for it because it was delayed so much that we cannot go now and ask for the money. 
Okay. So we hope the NGHT will help in some way. I hope so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sulema. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so Thank I think uh, yes. Guillermo, Guillermo has a, a hard time limit. So I would like to ask Guillermo to go next on the Las, Campa, Las Campanas situation. Guillermo, are you ready? Yes, of course. Okay, please proceed. Let me share my screen. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. That good? Oh, yeah. Yep. All right. Shall I start? Yeah, please do. Okay. So thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm here on behalf of Las Campanas Observatory, um, uh, the current institution for science that operates Las Campanas Observatory has not been involved in the EHT before, um, but we've been approached by the CFA and the University of Concepcion um, to do site testing for a potential NGA EHT antenna on the site. Uh, so I put together these slides uh, in order to allow the, the team to get to know the observatory a little better and get better context of the site uh, and the facilities that we have there. Um, so just a little bit of history, the Carnegie Observatories were founded by George Ellery Hale in the early 20th century, thanks to a generous donation uh, by, uh, by part of Andrew Carnegie. Um, and Hale uh, and his staff during the next 50 years basically dedicated themselves to building the largest telescopes in the world at the time. Uh, those were the 16-inch and 100-inch telescopes at Mount Wilson. Uh, built in, the, in 1908 and 1917, uh, and later on the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar. Um, but in the late 1960s, the Carnegie Observatories uh, shifted their focus and its efforts to the Southern Hemisphere um, and founded and created what's currently known as Las Campanas Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, the motivation here was to take advantage of the superb observing conditions of the Atacama Desert, uh, to find an extremely dark side away from big cities that generated light pollution, which was becoming a big problem in Southern California, uh, and to have access to Southern Hemisphere targets like the Galactic Center and Magellanic Clouds, uh, and also take advantage of the very welcoming relation that the Chilean government was starting to have with different international observatories like ESO and the National Optical Observatories uh, in the US that were also moving to sites like La Silla and Tololo. Um, the site itself at Las Campanas Observatory is a 20,000 hectare property owned by the Carnegie Institution for Science. Uh, inside our property, we have currently developed two mountain peaks uh, as part of the observatory. The Las Campanas Peak is where the giant Magellan Telescope is currently being built. Um, and Mankey's Peak uh, and Mankey's Ridge uh, are where we currently host the Magellan Telescope, so you can see here all our hotel and support facilities and, and, and what we call RoboRidge, which is a ridge that, is ho that, that hosts mostly uh, robotic facilities, right? These are mostly optical infrared uh, facilities and not uh, radio telescopes. Uh, dark is very sight, very, sorry, the, the site is very dark, as you can see here in the light pollution at Atlas. Uh, and the conditions are superb for optical infrared astronomy. We have very good image quality, uh, fairly low relative humidity and a very, very high number of clear nights uh, every year. Um, the facilities that we host here and we operate, uh, you can think of them in terms of the, what we call the Carnegie facilities, the ones that we operate as an observatory. The main star of the show is the Magellan telescopes with, that are two six and a half meter telescopes with a large suite of optical infrared instrumentation and adaptive optics uh, capabilities on one of them. And there's a consortium between Carnegie, who's the major uh, stakeholder, uh, and Harvard Center for Astrophysics, our U University of Arizona, MIT, and the University of Michigan. We also operate the DuPont telescope. This is a two and a half meter, uh, very wide field telescope that has served as a PI, you know, kind of uh, based uh, uh, telescope with a diverse suite of instrumentation in the past. But it's currently being fitted with a massively multiplex robotic fiber positioner, and it will be the southern telescope for the fifth version of the, of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, so the DuPont, we are basically transforming it into a, uh, on, into a massive uh, spectroscopic survey telescope. Um, 
And we also operate a one meter telescope called the SWOPE. This was the first telescope in Las Campanas. It had first light in 1971. Uh, and it is largely used for time domain astronomy by the Carnegie Supernova program and other projects. Uh, and even though it's the oldest telescope on the site, it remains, uh, it, it remains very relevant today. Uh, this was a telescope that actually discovered the first electromagnetic counterpart to a gravitational wave source, the famous Kilonova in 2017 here. Here you see the, the discovery image of the Kilonova taken with this uh, modest one meter telescope at Las Campanas. Um, so these are the facilities that we own. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the next big thing that's happening at Las Campanas is the Giant Magellan Telescope. We're all at the edge of our seats to know what is going to happen tomorrow with a report from the Decadal Survey. Uh, but the, as I mentioned before, the peak of, of one of the mountains of Las Campanas, the one that's actually called Las Campanas, is where this 20, roughly almost 25 meter sized effective area telescope made of seven segmented mirrors is currently being built. On top of our facilities, we also host a series of facilities. Sorry, I was too fast. Um, so we host a series of facilities uh, in this place that we call RoboRich. Um, these include mostly, uh, these include mostly robotic facilities and remotely operated facilities. Uh, largely imaging uh, small aperture telescopes, doing time domain astronomy, uh, exoplanet transit experiments, supernova follow-up, etc. Um, and you can see many of them here. You know, so this is the SOAP telescope, the one that we operate. Uh, but you see all this array of smaller containers and boxes and, and, and small domes. These are all remotely operated facilities or robotic facilities that, that we host for external institutions. Yeah, well, two more minutes. That's good. Um, in terms of supporting facilities for all our operations, you can expect to see Las Campanas where you typically find at any big observatory. Uh, so we have a fairly nice hotel here with you know, our sleeping quarters for staff and visiting astronomers and you know, a very nice dining room and break rooms and a library. Um, we have technical support facilities, including two coding facilities, both at Magellan and the DuPont telescope, clean rooms, electronic laboratories, machine shops, uh, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> the observatory has very good connectivity via fiber optics, uh, and it's fairly autonomous in terms of you know, uh, physical plant facilities, you know, road maintenance, power generation, et cetera. Uh, in La Serena, we have our uh, small campus called El Pino, uh, where we have our administrative staff. So anything related to logistics, transportation, shipment, procurement, et cetera, would be done based in La Serena. Uh, and at the observatory, we of course have a, a network of weather monitor stations that are uh, used both by our you know, own facilities and the, uh, the facilities that, that we host can actually connect to these weather uh, 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 services via databases and, and, and use them. In terms of- more. Yep, this is the last slide. Um, in terms of the staff at Las Campanas Observatory, we have a staff of about 100 people. Uh, the technical support staff that is mainly concerned with the operations and maintenance of telescopes, instruments, et cetera, uh, is composed of 32 FTEs, uh, and our people work on eight by six uh, day shifts. So they spend eight days, seven nights at the mountain, then they go home. Uh, so we have two shifts that alter alternate. And so we constantly have people uh, on the site. Um, and the main responsibilities of our support staff, our technical support staff, is the day-to-day -day operations and the maintenance of the Carnegie-operated telescopes, uh, so the Strobe, the Dupont, the Magellan, etc. Um, plus, you know, the development of upgrades um, and development of tools for our operations. Um, but our technical support staff also provides maintenance supports to the hosted facilities. Uh, in accordance to what is you know, stipulated in the different support agreements that we have with different institutions uh, that have uh, facilities working at the observatory. Now, the operations of the hosted facilities, which would be likely the category in which NGEHT could come to the observatory, uh, are today all either remote or robotic and fully, uh, and our full response, the full responsibility for them relies on the teams that are associated with this different hosted telescopes. Um, finally, 
Uh, we have been talking with uh, with, uh, with with the people in the NGHT team about uh, site testing at Las Campanas and potential sites for an NGHT antenna at the site. Uh, this is an aerial view of Robo Ridge from the DuPont telescope. These are all the robotic remote facilities I was talking about, and this is the Swap telescope. And we have identified in a very preliminary way, without any serious consideration for requirements, uh, three potential sites for an NGHT antenna and two uh, potential sites for site testing. I think last week we finally converged into using this uh, roof of the Couder room uh, of the DuPont telescope. So here uh, to place one of the water radio, uh, water uh, vapor radiometers, not a radiometer actually, you know, meters uh, and, you know, the cloud coverage, you know, uh, site testing setup uh, that will be installed here, um, ideally fairly soon. Uh, with a nice view of the celestial south pole. So that's an overview that's of minutes. the territory. Uh, welcome to Las Campanas. We're excited to have the NGHT team being interested in the site. Uh, and we're here to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Do we have any questions for Guillermo? It sounds like you are ready to have us come to Las Capanas. I hope you will give us a sweetheart deal. It's always <laughs> good to go to a site that's well prepared with good infrastructure. That's yep. a naive question. Of how, how big is the distance to Alma? Distance to Alma? That's a good question. Uh, I imagine it's, I don't know, but I would think it's on the order of thousands of kilometers. Um, maybe between a thousand and fifteen hundred. I should check, but Maybe it's 800, but order, order a thousand kilometers, I, I imagine. Yeah, it's almost the length of Chile. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next talk. Next talk is on the proposed 15 meter telescopes in China. Rusen, are you ready? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Please uh, share your screen. Share my screen. Yes, uh, just a second. Um, can you see my screen now? Yep, we can see you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to give you a very uh, brief introduction to the China's 15 meter seven millimeter telescope initiative. Uh, so I'm talking uh, on behalf of the uh, telescope team, which I um, uh, list all the members here. Uh, so I, I, I want to point out that uh, we are very open to domestic and international collaborations. Um, so here I'm showing a global and uh, Tibetan plateau of the uh, um, the PWV distribution and uh, on, on the top, so you see the winter uh, for the winter season and winter season and the, uh, the summer season on a global scale and uh, very obviously you, you see these four regions with very low uh, the, the PWV. Um, so here on, on the bottom, uh, so this is zoom in to the um, to the Tibetan uh, plateau. So, uh, in terms of the uh, the PWV, there should be uh, you know a very good size suitable for uh, millimeter and sub millimeter uh, astronomy. Um, so here I, I show this again. Uh, this has been discussed before uh, um, during the conference. Uh, so the current and the potential size uh, for the uh, next generation HT. So for, for the, uh, the, the so-called Yang Bajing station uh, in Tibet and the Dome A, these are also the sites we are very interested in uh, <clears throat> for future uh, sub-millimeter facilities. Um, so, uh, so as that's demonstrated uh, uh, in this work, um, so a sub-millimeter telescope in Western part of China for instance, in, in Tibet, we will, uh, we will add some uh, unique baseline coverage for imaging both Sagi star and M87. So you see the coverage here, uh, highlighting the contribution from the um, uh, telescope in Tibet. Uh, so, uh, but this is this is based on the uh, the current array uh, uh, for which I, I refer it as the Western array because all the uh, stations are in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sorry, my my. Okay, um, so such a telescope can contribute substantially, uh, you know, to improve the the uh, some millimeter VRBI capabilities uh, uh, for the uh, you know the the Eastern Array. Um, 
And uh, if we are after, you know, a continuous uh, global UV coverage for making uh, black hole movies, so, uh, so such a telescope will be indispensable. Um, so, so recently we, we made, we made uh, some uh, very simple uh, um, simulations. Uh, so for Sagittarius star, and here uh, on the top, uh, top left, I show the elevation versus time plot you know, for the existing stations and some uh, uh, station uh, and the planning, including one in, in Tibet, th this uh, RKZ. Uh, so if we, are, uh, if we focus on, on the Eastern array, so this is the corresponding uh, UV coverage on, on Sagittarius stars. So this is not as good as the, uh, the Western array, uh, but you know, with such a UV coverage, we can get a reasonably uh, good uh, reconstruction of, of the, uh, of the uh, image. So, uh, so uh, during the summer, uh, so the Chinese some millimeter uh, community, uh, you know, uh, get together and have several discussions on the future facilities of uh, you know at sub millimeter wavelengths, and uh, 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 so. Uh, so in the end, we we made a consensus, uh, you know, for promoting a 15 meter, uh, seven meter, meter telescope, and and uh, so we call it uh, smart. So here are some very preliminary uh, specifications. So the diameter will be 15 meter. Uh, this for the uh, wavelength range, uh, uh, it will start from three millimeter uh, to down to 0.4 millimeters, but this depends on the on the site. So the surface accuracy will be about 20 micron and with a pointing accuracy of about two arc seconds. So overall, we hope the performance uh, should be comparable to, uh, if not better than the existing telescopes of similar sizes. Uh, the we also talked to the, the domestic in industry community and uh, they are also very interested in this, uh, in this project. Um, so regarding the, uh, the, the site, so here I show some uh, uh, two potential sites. So one is the, uh, the, the Ali, Ali D, uh, which is in the uh, prefecture of uh, Ali of, the, of Tibet. So uh, the altitude is, uh, is uh, about 60,000 meters. Uh, it's close to, uh, to the county seat of uh, uh, Gur, and uh, it's also close to a national uh, highway. So the, uh, the winter temperature, the median value is about uh, minus 18 degrees, uh, so with the minimum about 20, uh, minus 27. So the, the wind is, uh, is melt, uh, and uh, the wind direction comes from, uh, it's south, from the southwest. So here on, on bottom you show, uh, I, uh, so I show the, um, so the monthly distribution of the PWV and uh, also the, uh, the density and the, Commutative distribution of, of the of the PWE. You, you can see uh, the so this is very very good. Um, so another potential site uh, is a place near uh, near uh, Chicago, so which is about uh, um, two hundred uh, kilometers uh, uh, from from Yangmating site. So the the altitude is about four thousand meters, uh, and. Uh, so uh, the good thing is that this uh, this uh, site uh, will uh, will be hosting an, uh, a forty meter uh, radio telescope. Uh, so the inf uh, so we, we will have an inf infrastructure for the uh, for the telescope. Recent two um, more minutes. Okay. Uh, so so recently we deployed a weather station to to this site. So so we, to monitor the. Uh, uh, the weather uh, conditions, for instance, here. So from the first of uh, uh, October, the temperature, the humidity, and the wind speed are, are plotted here. Uh, so we also calculated uh, based on the the Mera two data, uh, you know, some uh, the the PWV uh, uh, values for these three sites just for comparison. And so it turns out that for this uh, for this site in the summer. Uh, so the PWV is not as good as the you know uh, the the Ali uh, site. Um, so there uh, during the discussion, there are also proposal uh, to you know to uh, ultimately to move the the telescope to 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 the Arctic. Uh, and as you all know, so uh, the 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 Dome A is is uh, uh, you know a very uh, uh, good site for uh, millimeter sub millimeter astronomy or even you know terahertz 
So here are some uh, basic facts about dome A. So I, I, the time is limited. I won't go to, into the details. Uh, uh, but I, I personally, I think this will take a, a you know a long time uh, for you know moving a telescope there. Uh, so in, in summary, uh, so the uh, the seven millimeter community can went can went several discussions this summer and reach a, basically reach the consensus on a, a fifteen meter seven millimeter telescope. So uh, we we think a uh, seven millimeter telescope in the western part of China will add you know as demonstrated already uh, will add some unique baseline coverage to the current array. But more importantly, it will be dispensable for you know for continuous global UV coverage. It can bridge the gap. In, in longitude uh, for the existing and planned, uh, you know, NGHT size. Uh, so the domestic uh, in, uh, domestic industry uh, community also showed a uh, great interest uh, to this project. And they, unfortunately, the main fund, funding for, for the telescope is not there yet. Uh, but uh, regarding the timeline, we hope we, we, we can match the NGHT timeline. And we think international collaboration will be very, very important for promoting this, uh, this uh, project. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Luzan. Questions? Any questions? I had a question, Paul. Uh, yeah, go Paul. Let's go, Paul. Uh, given that this is, uh, there's a quite a windy site, uh, is, is the plan to have an open air telescope or a or a telescope with uh, some wind baffling some sort of a buffer around the telescope aperture uh, so you mean for this for this site yeah or even the other site you showed that, that the wind was somewhat high uh yeah the maximum is quite high uh but uh so on average i think it's it's so at this site is is you know it's not that high uh you know, just a couple of meters uh, per second. Okay. Uh, sorry, what, 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 what's your question? Are you planning an open air telescope or, or with something with a dome around it? Ah, uh, okay. Um, I think it's open, uh, you know, it's open. Uh... Okay. So, Rusin, I have a question. The yes? mutual visibility with Alma is not high, right, from Tibet? Uh, basically, I, I don't think there will be a, a... any. Any, uh, I, I think I have a plot somewhere. Yeah, here. Right, I think uh, mutual. Um, uh, yeah, there's no, basically no mutual. So this red line, red curve is for Tibet so, telescope. So, all the, other, no, no, so no all the other, so all the all the other telescopes have mutual visibility, which is very important because of the large collecting area of Alma. So yeah. that means that you are in baselines with other telescopes of equivalent size or smaller. So it, it, do you consider making it bigger than 15 meter? Is that a possibility? I, I think the community, community uh, think, think that the, a 15 meter telescope will be the first step. It can be larger, but um, you know, it depends. Uh, at the second step, maybe it can be a, a large telescope or even a, a, a array. I, I don't know, but for the first step, I think it's like a, a uh, 15 meter dish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the next project. Uh, we'll get a report from uh, Ming Tang on the GLT. Ming Tang, are you ready? Okay. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm Min Tan Chen. I'm from Taiwan, Academia Seneca um, Institute of Astronomy. Uh, this Greenland Telescope project is collaboration between us and uh, the uh, Central Astrophysics, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Um, so the photo show here is, uh, is, is uh, the GLT, we call it GLT, uh, Greenland Telescope. In, uh, uh, in Greenland. This is a photo of 2018 uh, located uh, location is in uh, Thule, the northwestern corner of Greenland. Um, the latitude is 76 degree, uh, well inside the Arctic Circle. But this is a 12, a 12 meter sub-millimeter telescope, uh, originally an uh, ALMA prototype, but uh, we uh, 
transformed it into an Arctic radio telescope. Um, the Tuli is a US air base, um, it's near the sea level. Um, it's our temporary site. Um, our final destination is Summit Station of Greenland, which has a very, very good um, atmospheric uh, condition for some sub millimeter astronomy. Uh, at this site, uh, from the past data, the, at 230 gigahertz, the, uh, the opacity is about uh, three times worse than the, uh, the summit station, uh, but it's an excellent uh, millimeter uh, wave site. Uh, particularly, it has a very strong stretch of the, uh, of the uh, atmospheric condition because of the, uh, the dark winter night. So the current status of this is, we de deploy this uh, telescope to Thule in first light in 2017. Uh, we have been uh, uh, participating in all this 80 gigahertz and 230 gigahertz VOBI observation since April 2018. Um, we are in Event Horizon Telescope and a global millimeter wave VOBI, BA array, BI array, GMBA. Um, the paper are coming, and um, you will see the impact of our telescope. Um, in the past couple of years, we developed this uh, remote local uh, operation. So uh, we are sitting far from, uh, from Cambridge or Taipei, and then we had some local help locally to help us to, uh, as our eyes and ears, and we are, we are able to conduct the uh, uh, BOBI operation. This year, we got the uh, non-coherence fringe detection between between us and the Alma, that's, uh, that's good news. Um, we also have a, a carry on a, a several different uh, developments in preparation for the future operation at some station. Um, one, way, one thing what we have been doing is expansion of the receiver capability. Um, we also are building our own 345 gigahertz cartridge. Currently the, the cartridge is Alma Band 7, but uh, because the service of support is, is, is not that um, straightforward. Uh, so we built our own. We are, we are able to fabricate junctions because we are part of the SMA, some millimeter array. And uh, from our experience with the front end integration center, so we built, the, uh, we built our own 345. It's coming, I'll show you later. Um, We're developing this concept of telescope on skis, I'll show you later. That's for the summit operation. Um, we explore various uh, uh, efficient operation model for summit operation. Um, we, are, we initiated the, uh, the East Asia submillimeter VOBI network in the past uh, couple of years. Um, uh, we're seeking a collaboration with uh, internationally. So this is what I mean by the expansion of receiver capability. Um, Currently, our first light is just like the, uh, the ALMA style. As you can see that we have a three cartridge uh, crash that uh, sitting in the center of the, of the Kessegren's focus. Um, uh, this three cartridge is our first light VOBI operation. Um, our phase two of what we are doing now is that we will expand the receiver into a, a three different kind of receiver. Um, in addition to the VLBI, we have a, we hope to have a multi-element heterodyne receiver. Uh, now we are talking to our collaborator for to install a millimeter camera um, in the in the receiver cabin. So um, if not because of pandemic, we actually the the cross that would uh, the receiver cabin will be looking something like this. So the VLBI receiver will be shifted sideways, and um, then we we have a second receiver bay here. Um, and then this is actually a nice Smith uh, focus instrument that we suppose we'll put a camera there. Uh, coming to this uh, 345 gigahertz receiver. So this is what we're building right now. Um, it's coming along well, it's very similar to, uh, to ARMAP. Is it, we, uh, we intentionally need to build our system to be ARMA cartridge compatible, meaning that all these if you build the Alma, Alma compatible cartridge, you can, you can put it into our system. Um, yes, uh, there's a lot of information here, but basically what we are, what we are 
what is saying is that it, our receiver will be uh, compatible in performance with the arm of the current arm of N7 receiver. Um, the timeline, um, we have been uh, stuff application is beginning of this year. Um, um, it's, Two minutes, Ming Tang. Yes, so we, we are getting all the components and we're already putting things together. Um, so by the end of the year, we should be able to start the, uh, the receiver test performance. Um, so this is in preparation for the future uh, summit, states, uh, summit operation. Our, we are taking on this uh, idea of putting the entire telescope on a ski. So telescope will be sitting on is a, a foundation, steel foundation. Um, and then that's on foundation we're sitting on a ski like this. Uh, this is not a new idea, but this certainly will be the first idea that uh, they put, put on a, some, mini, some mini meter telescope. The concept will be like this. We have, we are almost having the design of this. Um, so this will be something uh, we, the reason we put it like this is we want to be able to, uh, to, to move the telescope in every other years uh, uh, because we don't want the telescope to be buried by snow. Uh, well, this is our wish list for GLT housing. Um, at the beginning of the project, we have, but this actually is a British uh, Poly 6, one of the module, very fancy. Uh, we would we, really like to have one of this, but uh, we, we actually have the, uh, the, the design, a, 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 a blueprint similar to this, uh, but I think uh, eventually we'll probably will settle for something less glamorous. Really. I'd like to have one of this. Anyway, so uh, we're in, um, in the process of uh, seeking collaboration. Um, we have a letter of agreement in progress with our Danish partners. Um, the collaboration will be in astronomy, in instrumentation, and also for the construction on summit station. In fact, this uh, the skis concept is that we learned from our Danish partner, he, who has a very good uh, uh, smart uh, experience in on the IC agreement. So. Uh, we are still planning, promoting, um, uh, raising fund, fundraising for, for this project. I'm a wel welcome collaborators. Um, I hope that we will see you at the station. Thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Ming Tang. Questions? So, Ming Tang, do you have all the budget? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm raising it. I'm selling books. Uh, I'm also selling some other thing. Maybe I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope the NGEHT will help you. I need to, well, well, I think, but well, first we need, we need cash donation, uh, contribution. Um, uh, if not, if you don't have a cash contribution, we need your spirit, spiritual support to, pr to promote for us. Summit Station is such a critical site. Um, it's such a nice site for, for North Hemisphere. Um, it's too bad if we don't have a big telescope up there. Okay. Any other Paul, questions? Paul, I have a question. Yes, TK. Oh, okay, um, Ming Tang, uh, that was a nice overview. Uh, I had a quick question on what kind of time scale do you have in mind for uh, summit deployment? Is there anything um, you can say about it? Technically, technical because some some other technic, technic, technicality concern. We have a we have a window probably 2024-25. in that two three years window. So we really that would be a. Well, that would be a good window to, to go up there because of, we can utilize some of the existing uh, capability up there. So you have funding and all that uh, in place for doing that? Uh, we have some, but not all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ming Tang. Okay. Uh, so it turns out Mark is uh, not available due to a conflict schedule, so we won't have a talk on the Africa Telescope. So we go to the final talk.
which is on the uh, expanded KVN. Uh, bon Wang, are you ready? Okay, uh, uh, let me share my screen. Thank you, Bon Wang. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Please proceed. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to introduce uh, extension of extension project of Korean BLBI network. Um, my name is Bong Son. I'm working at uh, Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute. And the most of the presentation material here uh, came from uh, Do Young Byun, who is leading this uh, fourth uh, Korean uh, BLBI network telescope uh, construction pro project. Uh, after Maria's excellent talk yesterday, I believe you are now familiar with the benefits of multi-frequency simultaneous observation at millimeter and sub-millimeter band. And uh, I will briefly introduce Korean Bear Network and lesson we learned from the operation of multi-frequency operation uh, observing system, which might be useful for NGHT planning. Um, here you see uh, three uh, telescopes which are in operation and uh, Korean Bell Bear Network sh uh, shortly uh, KVN consists of three telescopes in Korea. This is a compact Bell array with its ba baselines range from 300 kilometer to 500 kilometer in the, the southern half of Korean peninsula. All three telescopes uh, rotate university campuses and two of them, uh, one in Seoul and the other in Ulsan, uh, located in central areas of metropolises. Uh, KPN has a unique capability to absorb four frequencies and simultaneously, as you heard from uh, Maria yesterday. This multi-frequency observing system allows you to compensate uh, fast phase change due to tropospheric uh, phase change. And you can get a uh, phase solution from low frequency to high frequency, which is called uh, phase, uh, uh, frequency phase transfer. With FPT, we can extend the coherence time uh, um, at 86 or 130 gigahertz up to, uh, up to several hours if we like. By combining uh, switching between the target and the cal calibrator, uh, several minute, minute interval, uh, we can also remove remaining dispersive phase errors, which mainly come from ionospheric and instrumental phase change. So we call this technique uh, SFPR, uh, source frequency phase referencing. You heard that uh, yesterday from Maria's talk as well. So why uh, K, uh, to extended KVN? Uh, the reason why is that we have only three telescopes. Uh, and uh, so we have a poor UV uh, sampling. And um, at high frequency, we had trouble with amplitude calibration. Uh, we cannot do uh, self amplitude calibration with uh, just three telescopes. So we want to add one more telescope, but we want to upgrade also uh, the capability at higher frequency. Here I show the specific specification of antenna, new antenna. In the parentheses, you see the uh, specification of uh, all uh, three KVN telescopes. So we are uh, upgrading the capability of the telescope. And here I show the telescope sites uh, and three telescopes and the new one in Pyeongchang, all four telescopes. Uh, locate in the university campuses. And uh, the, the highest uh, site is the Pyeongchang new site is about 500 meter sea level. And the Pyeongchang is the place where the, the last winter Olympic game are uh, uh, held. And uh, we have actually one more six meter telescope close to uh, uh, Yonsei, KBN Yonsei. Uh, which is also located in the campus, Seoul National University. And so we have a very short 12-meter 
12 kilometer baseline between uh, Cape and Yonsei and SRAO, which is located in the Seoul National University. Here I show the um, receiver um, plate uh, design where you see um, many mirror filters and uh, the receiver room uh, play room for uh, 230 gigahertz. And uh, here, uh, different from the K old KVN design, we have a trip, uh, compact triple receiver cabin here, which will uh, uh, have a KQW band receiver in a cabin, uh, in a small uh, compact uh, cabin. And uh, there is a room for the lower frequency receivers as well. And uh, this CTR will be also uh, uh, deployed to several European telescopes in, in the coming years. So I'm coming to the EHT uh, related uh, plan uh, in the coming years. We are preparing three, uh, 230 gigahertz tests on KB and Yonsei to test single dish and BLBI capabilities before uh, KB and Pyeongchang, uh, the new telescope comes. We are developing 230 gigahertz test receiver under the collaboration with Asia A and, on, and Osaka Prefecture University and also with uh, Seoul National University Radio Telescope of Triple Three. Okay, thank you. Uh, receiver assembly and uh, laboratory test will start uh, this month. And I, actually, the uh, is on, already assembled. And hopefully, we will start install it in uh, at uh, KB and Yonsei next month. In the coming month, coming winter, uh, we want to test this uh, 230 gigahertz receiver with uh, um, available millimeter uh, telescope or, or like. Uh, JCMT, GLT, and SRAO. It is called now EAVN High. And unfortunately, the, the uh, mirror filters at uh, KB and Yonsei is not optimized for 230 gigahertz. So we are expecting about 20% uh, of loss. Uh, otherwise, it should be less than 5%. So we are ordering new filter mirrors for 230 gigahertz. But anyway, for a strong source, I think we can do a BLBI test uh, with the multiple frequency uh, capability. So, with the multi frequency uh, capability, we want to test want to test also frequency phase transfer, and uh, which means even we have only one uh, two hundred thirty gigahertz telescope, we could uh, get the phase solution solution for two hundred thirty gigahertz receiver because we have uh, other two telescopes which can observe together uh, at 86 or 43 gigahertz. So with EAVN high, we want to test the, uh, the uh, correlation. And if possible, maybe we could participate in some uh, EHT session and uh, provide uh, 230 gigahertz data 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, KVN to EHT um, to see how does it work. And the last page, uh, what we learned from KVN operation with uh, uh, we, we now uh, understand that the weather proof millimeter sub millimeter or VLBI operation is possible even at uh, urban or suburban area at low sea level uh, site with multi-frequency receiver. And uh, we can get a higher sensitivity with, because of the long integration time. And uh, thanks to SFPL, uh, chromatic astrometry is possible. But people worry about the uh, construction cost and the comp because of complex uh, quasi-optics and many receivers. and. And so far, uh, one good news is that RFI at millimeter or sub-millimeter is not so prob problematic. And uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, consideration or suggestion to e NGHT. Uh, with this kind of multi-frequency receiver system, maybe a less invasive operation could be possible. 
So which means telescope can um, locate uh, urban or suburban area uh, like KBN. And um, when you have telescope in suburban area or urban area, there will be less problem with uh, uh, power grid or fiber or expert or any kind of service. So infrastructure costs less uh, when you have telescope in this uh, city area. Um, uh, that's all. Thank you, Bong Wong. Questions? What is the uh, time scale for the new telescope to get to finish line? Um, in two years, I think uh, it will be operational in 2023. And the budget is already in hand? Oh, yeah. Luckily, we got a uh, budget. Oh, that's very good. Other questions? Well, I'd like to thank all the speakers for this section for sticking to the time. We are just a little bit overrun in time, but not too much. Uh, it's very encouraging that all of these uh, projects are underway, uh, independent of the NGEHT fundraising and will add to the uh, Event Horizon Telescope operation in the future. Uh, under all their own funding in one way or another. So that's very good for our future. I think it uh, shows that the project has been inspiring for many, many groups beyond the original partners. Okay, I pass back to the local organizing committee. Thank you. Uh, so now we will have our poster session. Uh, first, we have 10 minutes of lightning talks followed by uh, some extended discussion in a couple of breakout rooms. Uh, you will find also these posters uh, in the channel labeled uh, day three poster session in the Slack. Uh, each of the presenters has uh, their own poster as a comment. And if you'd like to uh, comment or ask a question about their work, you can reply uh, on the Slack channel there. Uh, we're going to start now with uh, these uh, 10 minutes of uh, uh, lightning round talks. We have five total. Uh, so speakers, uh, you will hear my alarm go off after two minutes. And uh, if you have multiple pages, as a couple of you do, just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Uh, our first poster is from uh, Antonio Jose Vasquez Alvarez. And I'm, I'm actually not sure if, if you are here. Uh, so let me know if, if you are, Antonio. Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Guang Yao Zhao, who's going to tell us about the power of simultaneous multi frequency observations for millimeter VLBI. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so thanks. Uh, this poster is about uh, the uh, benefits of having. Uh, uh, simultaneous multi-frequency uh, receiving system as just uh, introduced by Bong Wan and also uh, Maria in, in introduced uh, yesterday. So the, uh, the when we have multi-frequency oscillations at the same time, it, it is possible to use a lower frequency oscillation to calibrate uh, a higher frequency one to remove the uh, tropospheric propagation effects, which, uh, which are the ones that cause the fast uh, phase fluctuations at the, uh, at the the higher frequency, which limits the coherence time. So after such a calibration, the coherence time can be significantly extended, like uh, from less than one minute to tens of minutes. So this enables uh, the detection of uh, weak targets at uh, high frequency. Uh, one project that built on this advantage is the uh, multi-frequency agent survey with uh, KVN led by uh, Tian and John. Uh, so far, this project has uh, achieved fringe detection of uh, 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 more than 600 uh, sources at uh, 3 millimeter and uh, uh, more than 300 sources at uh, 2 millimeter. Um, another benefit, uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, Maria and Bong Wan, is that the possibility of doing astrometry at uh, millimeter wavelengths. 
uh, this has been demonstrated with the PVN uh, up to two millimeter. But with PVN alone, it is always limited by the angular resolution uh, because of the short uh, baselines. So, uh, but the, the simultaneous receiving has now becoming available at uh, an increasing number of uh, telescopes in in those, those in Japan, in Europe, and Australia. So this already gives us a global array with uh, uh, astrometric uh, capability at millimeter wavelengths. But our that our... is time. My alarm was very quiet. Apparently. Oh, sorry. How, how long did I actually take? Uh, that was two minutes. Uh, if you have any final thoughts, uh, one... please wrap up. Yeah, it, it, it will be great that uh, if we can detect weak sources and do astrometry with the uh, NGHC. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I see in the chat that Antonio Jose is actually here. Uh, can you can you try speaking using your mic, please? Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, we can hear you now. Uh, so let me go back to to your poster here. You have two minutes, and I'll let you know when that's over. Okay. So hello, everyone. My name is I'm connecting from Spain. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for allowing me to present in this poster. So the poster is self-explanatory. So I will try to just give some context to it. So to give a little bit of context, I developed a VLGI correlator in Python a few years ago. Right when I Antonio, you're actually growing quieter and quieter. Oh, really? So yes. Let me try to bring up the volume. So what about now? Maybe a little bit better. Uh, uh, that worked for a second. OK. It seems like the microphone is adjusting. So and, and now, is it a bit better or? That sounds good, I think. Okay, so I'll try to speak louder. Okay. So, okay, so I was telling that I developed a VLBI correlator in Python a few years ago at MIT Haystack, which is called Correlex. And for this project, I basically took the building blocks and re engineered them to, to make it work with Apache Spark, which is a parallelization framework, and try to make it faster. So this poster basically presents a comparison between Corelex, CXR338, which is the, the project, and Defix. And it shows some snapshots running CXR338 on Amazon Web Services. So it also presents some scalability and performance results, which follow the experiment setup, describing a paper that may sound familiar to some of the organizers, which are, which are authors of this paper, which is prospects for wide band VLB correlation in the cloud. And the project is still a prototype. It's the work of four months in my spare time, but I thought that the results look quite promising. Promising, So I just wanted to share them with the community in case somebody is interested and would like to continue with the project. So thank you everyone for, for, your, for your attention. Thanks, and thanks for staying on time. Uh, next, we'll move on to Ilje Cho talking about the intrinsic size of Sajay Star. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ilja Cho. Uh, I'm a postdoc work, uh, at IAA CSIC in Spain, uh, working with the Jose Luis Gomez. And in this presentation, I have summarized our uh, study towards sectors A star uh, using the East Asian VLBI network. So the main goal of this study is measuring uh, the intrinsic size of such at 22 and 43 gigahertz. So uh, first, there are many attempts to measure the intrinsic size of such and it has been known as just elliptical Gaussian well describes its structure. So there are many uh, measurements towards such uh, but there are, <coughs> sorry, uh, there are also another uh, suggestions of the better uh, scattering mitigation models. So in this study, we have applied the recent scattering studies to mitigate the scattering effects from the observation and uh, we extracted uh, the intrinsic size of such star. The important point of this study is uh, the observations were carried out as quasi simultaneously with EHT in 2017. And since this is part of the multivalence uh, campaign of the EHT, there are many other counterparts of uh, the observations, not only uh, the 230 gigahertz, but also we have the 86 gigahertz observations. So uh, together with our uh, size measurement, we have compared uh, this size with 86 gigahertz and derived uh, its wavelength dependence as shown in the right 
upper right corner of this poster. So uh, with this wavelength dependence, we also extract, uh, excluded uh, the extrapolated uh, to the size at 230 gigahertz, and we uh, expected uh, the size of the 230 gigahertz. And based on this, uh, the results, uh, we interpreted our results with uh, the equation flow model that concluded uh, the non-thermal electrons are uh, necessary to explore, ex uh, explain our uh, the size measurements. And with this, uh, we expect uh, the uh, there is a synergy of the EHT and NGHT in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Wu Jiang. And uh, I believe you had two uh, slides here. So just let me know when to advance. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Wu Jiang from Shanghai Astronomical Observatory. I'm very glad to. Uh, have an opportunity to introduce our uh, recent uh, fresh work for the new target for NGHT. As we know, uh, such as STAR and the M87 have the uh, largest uh, black hole shadow, so they are the best candidate, uh, the targets for EHT and NGHT. Here on this poster, we will introduce M84, another target we, who had a black, hole, a black hole shadow of uh, zero, zero micro arc second to 10 uh, micro arc second. It's in the second group for, for the uh, black hole shadow who has the uh, uh, largest uh, shadow. And uh, also I, our recent uh, we will be an observation up to eight eight gigahertz indicate that it should have uh, correlated flux density up to two thirty and three forty five gigahertz, and several tens of Mach density. So it means it have a good uh, dynamic range for future NGHT observations. And 30 seconds. Other, uh, two, uh, in summary, M84 is an uh, ideal source for confirm the confirmed uh, black foreshadow. And also, it has a large scale jet and also inner jet. So we can investigate the black foreshadow and the, its uh, jet uh, core or uh, jet base in the same image as well. Thank you. Thank you for staying on time. Finally, we have uh, Mikia Takahashi, who will be talking about the de uh, development of a time-dependent GRRT code cartoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mikia Takahashi, a PhD student at the University of Tsukuba. And we developed new three-dimensional and time-dependent general relativistic radiative transfer code named Cartoon. Uh, sorry, please go to page five. Five, OK. Well, thank you. And this is an overview of our new code Cartoon. Uh, cartoon solves the general relativistic radiative transfer as follows. And the most important updated point is that uh, we solve the transport of the intensity in photon number conservation scheme along geodesics. Uh, and light panel is a schematic picture of cartoon. Uh, cartoon has some strong points. Um, first, cartoon calculates with less numerical diffusion since the general relativistic radiative transfer is uh, solved along, along geodesics. And second, cartoon guarantees the conservation of photon number since the general relativistic relative transfer equation is solved in photon number conservation scheme. And third, the intensity map on the observer's screen is also obtained since some geodesics leading to the observer's screen are set. 30 seconds. Okay. In my poster, uh, we perform the wavefront calculation with cartoon. Uh, as a result, uh, cartoon successfully reproduced the radiation propagation around the curve black hole. 
Uh, in addition, the perfect time dependent intensity map on the observer screen is also obtained. Okay, please feel free to ask on Slack if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we will now open up breakout rooms where we've we've split them up into two uh, for the the first three of these presenters and the second. Uh, and then, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, feel free to give them comments on the poster session channel in the Slack as well. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and I hope we have continued discussions with these posters. <laughs>